All right, welcome everyone to the Phoenix Report. I'm Jack Connor. Uh, big news in the world of rock and roll today, as many of you have heard. Avenge Sevenfold, one of my favorite bands, has announced they have a brand new drummer. Uh, his name is Brooks Wackerman, formerly of Bad Religion, The Vandals, and he's uh, worked with plenty of other artists as a studio and touring musician. Um, I definitely have a lot of thoughts on this, mainly because I am a huge Avenge Sevenfold fan, as most of you guys know. Um, yeah, I mean, they're definitely one of my favorite bands, uh, certainly of the last, you know, 10 plus years, very accomplished. They're, they're sort of one of those bands where they might not necessarily be a household name, but they have a huge enough fan base where, you know, kind of like Iron Maiden, where it's like they, they sell out arenas and everything, but they're not necessarily known to everybody, but to their fans, you know, that they, they have a very passionate fan base is what I'm saying. Um, you know, I, I definitely have a lot of thoughts on uh, on getting this uh, getting this new drummer in the fold, but the thing is, I myself don't play drums, and you know, not that I necessarily need to play drums to appreciate it, but I figure it would be best to talk to two guys who are actually very good drummers and happen to be friends of mine. Uh, one is uh, someone that you all know uh, if you've listened to this podcast for a while. He's a regular on the uh, wrestling related podcast, and he has an episode of his own. I'm speaking, of course, of Brian Connolly. Yo, 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 what's up? Of course, the uh, <laughs> the Jesse Ventura to, Vi- to my Vince McMahon. I thought it was I thought it was Bobby Heenan to your girl a but that's I, all right. I, I decided to switch it up a little bit. All right. Um, yeah, but I'm, Brian, of course, is mainly known as a guitarist in the Schmelz, but he is also an accomplished drummer as well. I've heard him play, so he he definitely has experience on that instrument as well. And also joining us, uh, returning to the podcast, he was actually the second guest I've ever had, a uh, former Zebra Geist bandmate of mine, coming all the way from Cleveland, Ohio, Eric Bertinoli. What's up, man? Hey, how's it going, everybody? Glad to have you back, man. Glad to be back. Thanks for asking me to do this. Anytime. Eric, of course, is also the host uh, or one of the co-hosts of the Music Speaks podcast here on iTunes. Uh, excellent uh, podcast, especially if you're in the uh, Ohio area. He speaks with a lot of, um, you know, a lot of local bands in that part of the country. But um, first, first impressions, guys. Uh, obviously, um, it was announced this morning on the Talk Is Jericho podcast hosted by Chris Jericho. Uh, he, you know, basically broke the news there that uh, that they finally named who it was, and it was Brooks Wackerman. Were you guys, uh, you know, how did you guys feel um, when they made this announcement? Um, I myself, this is Brian, was very surprised, uh, and, but in a in a p- pleased way. Like I, it was pleasant news to be surprised. It wasn't like I don't know who I expected it to be, but just I don't know for whatever reason, not in a million years, I thought it would be Brooks Wackman because I'm a huge Bad Religion fan, and I'm a huge fan of the Vandals and various other things. I think Tenacious D, he's played with. Yeah, yeah. He so, had. dude's got quite a resume. He's still young. He helped breathe new life into Bad Religion when he joined the band. It was like they their dudes were like twice his age, but he, you know, it's pretty pretty cool choice, man. If you ask me, uh, I think those guys made the right decision. Right, right. Er- Eric, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I would agree. I mean, when uh, there were a million names going through my head of who it could possibly be, and then you know, I tuned into the podcast. I'm actually hitting refresh on my way into work because I always like to know things right when they happen. So I knew Jericho was going to announce it. I just kept hitting refresh. Finally, nine o'clock rolls around. It pops up. Yeah. I listen. I fast forward through all his commercials, and then they say it's Brooks Wackerman. And I, my first thought was like. Did not expect that. That came kind of out of left field because I figured they would try to get like another metal guy. Um, Not to say that he can't play metal, but, you know, he's not really known for super fast double double bass and blast beats and all that. He's got a lot of group. Uh, He's got a lot of soul in his playing. And I think he's as soon as I thought about it for 30 seconds, I thought this is going to be perfect. They're going to put out a great record with him behind the kit. Absolutely. And, and, you know, uh, that, that's, that's one of those things where, I mean, I have heard of Brooks Wackerman. I've obviously heard that he was in bad religion and that he's played with tenacious D and all these other things. Um, I gotta be honest with you guys. I gotta make a, make a confession here. I don't really, I'm not familiar with any of his work in bad religion. Like I, you could put a gun to my head and I couldn't name one <laughs> bad religion song. Bad, bad religion wasn't really like a radio mainstay or MTV really. You know, like they had a few. I wouldn't call them hits, but mm-hmm. songs that not like they're not household name right. type things. I, I I mean, I'm I'm familiar with. I mean, I, I've heard of Bad Religion. I know they're a lead. 
I know they're a legendary punk band. I know I've heard of Brooks Wackerman. I've heard of his brother, Chad. Yeah, yeah. He comes from a very musical family, dude, and they're all outstanding musicians. Uh, yeah, Brooks Wackerman started out with the Vandals, but he was the alternate drummer when Josh Freese wasn't available, who that dude is also an amazing, like, legendary studio drummer. He's played with everybody. Yeah. Um, so you know, Josh Freese, Brooks Wackerman, the, the Vandals had really good <laughs> taste in drummers, you could say. Right. So then, uh, yeah, actually, I was going to say Bad Religion's most recent album in 2013. Eric said that he's not familiar with him playing blast beats and double bass. He started to add a little bit of that in Bad Religion, which is like amazing to me. I, I say, love that's the interesting. Idea. <laughs> yeah, man, like just a little bit. But he was like, I was going to say their most recent album. They wrote one of the fastest songs they've ever written. And they've been around for 35 years now, as long as I've been alive. Uh the Vandals as well. The Vandals and Bad Religion both started in the year 1980. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, but the fact that they're legendary doesn't mean, you know, like punk rock isn't mainstream, obviously. Not everybody's heard. No, I mean, and, and, no, I mean, and, and that's a punk thing. I myself was never really a big punk guy, but I mean, obviously I respect the hell out of it. Um, do you have any, yes, like, man. do you have any, like, recommendations on, like, you know, particular songs or particular things that would, like, highlight Brooke, Brooks Wackerman's playing? Uh, yeah, I mean, like, to start out with Bad Religion, there's so many albums, but he was only on the last five. And I'd say the first one that he appeared on in 2002 is called The Process of Belief. The very first song that comes on, I feel like it'll, if it doesn't get your attention, like nothing else on the album will. It's like, <laughs> right off the bat, you're like, holy, it's like when Travis Barker started with Blink years ago. Right. It's like a whole new band to me. Like, Blink was like an okay band, and then mm -hmm. when he joined the band, Obviously not much recent stuff, but, uh, you know, Blink-182 and they got a new drummer made it, made the right choice. Sometimes all it takes is just like Mike Portnoy playing with Avenged Sevenfold and on that album Nightmare was, I, I kind of thought they would go back to him for whatever reason, but I don't know. Yeah, I think it was his uh, personality and his age that he didn't really click with them. I think that's why it, it, he didn't end up sticking around with them. He, 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 you know, I love Mike Portnoy. He, I've, oh, I know. I know. He's my favorite drummer. He's my my biggest influence easily. But dude is dude is kind of a drama queen at times. Yeah, uh, I was gonna say he's a he's a Long Island douche, and I'm from Long Island, so I could say that. <laughs> and I know enough of dudes. He reminds me of so many dudes that just like uh, I don't know, so douchey. Like he's awesome. There's nothing to say. He's one of the best drummers in the world, but. Just, well, I mean, I, I I had never heard of like I mean, because uh, from what I hear, the Avenged Sevenfold guys they still get along with Mike and they're still friends with him. A as I understood it, like they they never really had any intentions of making him a permanent member. Obviously, yeah. he was there to fill in, and he did some some live stuff with them as well. He well, did, he, he did either a full quit court. or he either quit or got fired from Dream Theater too. I don't remember. Well, no, that's huge. Yeah, he he left Dream Theater. I think. Well, I mean, because, you know, the way I understand it, um, you know, I mean, obviously now pe people tend to forget this, but Mike Portnoy was never considered an official member of Avenged Sevenfold. Oh, I didn't know that. No, he wasn't an official, like, full-fledged member. He, you know, he played on the record, he did the one tour with them, but he he was never meant to be, like, a permanent replacement for... Yeah, for... but I mean, like, how would you feel, dude, if you filled in playing bass? <laughs> You'd feel like you were in the band. For a little while, and then they're like, "All right, dude, thanks. You know, send you on your way." But I'm well, I mean, sure you I, got. I, I'd I'd feel pretty grateful to have that gig in the first place, but it's especially uh... since like you left your other band, like he left Dream Theater. To, uh, that's how it seemed to me. Well, yeah, Dream I mean, Theater. I guess may maybe Mike thought that he was a shoe in to to be in there permanently. Maybe, and I think Dream Theater was kind of pissed that he was looking to play with another band, like because Dream Theater is a pretty extensive. <laughs> project that uh, time consuming i imagine right well i mean now i mean um, mike portnoy plays is in like six different bands right now yeah so yeah. i mean he's definitely you know he's doing okay so he's keeping busy but um no i mean as i understand it uh you know i guess portnoy left dream theater the avenge guys had nothing to do with that they were like they, they weren't expecting him to do that they just wanted him to play on the record and i think and i think portnoy had it in his mind that it was like oh well of course they're going to want to hire me full-time Revenge Sevenfold, but they're like, no, nah, we 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 just kind of needed you for this. That that wasn't what they had in mind. Or, I mean, again, we're all speculating this. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't, don't know how we ended up talking about Mike Portnoy so much. <laughs> I guess because he played in Avenged Sevenfold for a little yeah. bit. 
And, but, and, he, and he did a great job on Nightmare. Obviously, that that was fantastic. Well, I was going to say, like, man, the Rev and Mike Portnoy, those are huge shoes to fill and very, like, intimidating to any other drummer. But I got to say, man, if anybody could pull it off, Brooks Wackerman is the is the dude man like don't don't sleep on him like don't underestimate him he's he's an amazing drummer i think if they spend the right, right amount of time with him recording letting him learn all their shit it's gonna blow people away and it just kind of begs the question why would they do what they did with their last drummer on well, that one album? well i mean i and this is this is what i understood with uh with aaron aaron illage was the, their last drummer who yes. by the way i think he was great I think I think he did a great job. Yeah, but he I, was like purposely put in a position of being like held back because they wanted to scale it back, and it seemed very like just dumbed down, kind of it's like. It is, what? And if you listen to the uh, like the interviews that they did when they were recording, was that that record was called Hail to the King, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you listen to the interviews around then with the other guys in the band, they're like, well, he wanted to play all this flashy stuff like the Rev, but we wanted to make something more like the Black Album, so yeah, we yeah. had to like try and try and try, and we're like, is this the right guy? He can't play slow. He can't play just you know four on the floor type beats, and you know, and if you listen to it, it really does it. Hit, it sounds forced if you listen to the record. It yes, doesn't sound very, very natural so. to be playing like that at all. And I liked their, you know, their albums leading up to that. Each one seemed to get better and better. And that one, I don't know, not that it was disappointing. It was just kind of like the drummers holding back, <laughs> like a lot. Like well, the, I mean, I, I don't think the songs really called for a lot of flashy stuff. I, I by the way, I loved that record. I loved Hail to the King. I thought it was great. Uh, it's just hard to follow up Nightmare, which you know was the number one album for them, and even the one before that. Uh, just a self-titled one, but I mean that was those are different drummers. Those are different drummers. But different. that's what Avenged has always done. They've always done different stuff. So it's like I, I don't think that's really fair to even compare that because they they've all they always try new stuff on each of their records. Well, so. I guess it seems I don't like when a band directly tries to like emulate or cop another. Like, why are they doing a black album? Like, <laughs> don't force a black album out of yourself. Metallica didn't know they were making the classic album they were making you know like I, you can't I, I don't think they were black. trying to do that brian I, I i i think i mean i think they wanted to make like a classic you know sounding i mean yeah obviously there are similarities also to that, i but... remember that aaron dude wasn't even familiar with megadeth slayer pantera because he's so young is what well, i heard yeah, they... I, I mean i think that's that that's the thing and, and based on the interview i heard um I, I don't know how much you guys listened to that interview they had with chris jericho this morning it actually answers a lot of your questions oh but i didn't I, finish the interview obviously. well i'm glad you're prepared for this i, <laughs> I, got, I got the information <laughs> i needed <laughs> from oh, chris jericho saying brooks wackerman and i was like i'm out <laughs> you, you could have told me this too. shit before i invited you on my podcast to talk uh, about did, this did you depth. invite me or did i invite myself on the podcast well i mean I, I i invited you i guess i should have known better but uh, i am Bobby Heenan of the bunch. The you you uh, are you are a classic heel. Uh. All right, we're not talking about wrestling. <laughs> you missed a lot of True Car ads. I'll say that. Yeah, that's true. He is Jericho is the king of the segue. By the way, holy shit, he slips those ad those ad reads in there. Yeah, the fucking the one about somebody shaving right at the beginning. Dollar right? Shave Club. Dollar yeah. Shave Club. My, but it's isn't it November where you're not supposed to shave? Who cares? <laughs> he, Chris doesn't give a shit. He's getting paid. I mean, you know, I would do shit. the same thing too if someone would sponsor my podcast. I gotta, well, you probably don't know much about it because you're not on like punk news sites and shit like I see. I'm on probably, Facebook. I'm probably gonna lose sponsorships because of this crap right now. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't worry about it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Got Ico Pro. It's in there forever. K favorite. <laughs> Locked in. Ico uh, Pro. Uh, no, a lot of people. A lot of people are giving Brooks Wackerman shit over like. Would you leave Bad Religion to play with Avenged Sevenfold? Like, fuck yeah, I would. I like money. Well, I, why, I, I, like, I, I, <laughs> why isn't that why anyone is alive? Is to just make a lot of money? Fuck. Well, I, I don't, I don't know if, I don't know if that's why he left Bad Religion. That, was, that might have been I, something completely separate. We don't know that. That's, that's true. He actually left Bad Religion like a week ago. But Avenged Sevenfold said that they've been playing with this guy for like a year. Okay, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously that had been in the works for a while. Like they, they, yeah, I mean, like they're just calling him a sellout, and it's like I hate that shit, man. In the world of, you don't really see much of that anywhere else. But in punk, everybody's always like, "Oh man, you got to stay." It's that punk rock guilt. I think that's what you're they not supposed it. to be. You're not supposed to be successful in music. You're not supposed to sound good. You got to play those CFW I, hall, no barricade. 
right. it's supposed to be mediocre forever and you know whatever no, uh, I, I, think I, I would agree that there's a lot of that in, I would argue that there's a lot of that in metal too but I won't go into that right. some well, metal snobs out there oh yeah they're every they're elitist <laughs> high fidelity type record store dudes they're everywhere Right. They know everything, and they yeah. oh, they suck now. Oh, that is that, is that another Jack Black connection we decided to th- throw in there because he played? Yeah, with High B? Fidelity is a great example of how people <laughs> are now. Like when I buy, an, which is why I don't buy albums anymore in stores. But I used to buy, like I'd buy a Slipknot album, and a guy'd be like, "Ah, oh, this is nothing but noise." I was like, I didn't ask you for your fucking opinion on what I'm buying. It's like That's really, du- really, dude, who works here? Aren't you just supposed to just take my money and shut up? And <laughs> like Seriously. you're working. But that's why we've eliminated the need for shit like that. We go online. We're like, well, I'll look at reviews, but it's not going to make me. Whatever. I don't know what the fuck we're talking about right now. <laughs> well, as usual, you've completely diverted this off, Eric. <laughs> it's so, it's great. Eric. I'm, I'm going to turn this over to you, Eric. Did, did you listen to the uh, to the interview that Chris Jericho had? I listened to it until I got to work. I got about maybe. 10 15 minutes into it right before he took his first segue where he's like oh yeah and it's really hard to replace the rev and speaking of replacement when you have to replace your car <laughs> use true car. he is he really is the king of the segue <laughs> That's but, awesome. hey god bless him he, he's getting paid so whatever yeah i don't, but no, I don't fault him for it. it it was cool to hear like you know why they it, it, i listened to the part where m shadows was talking about why they got uh why they got rid of the uh aaron and it, it made sense, honestly, when you listen to it. He's part of a different generation. Obviously, he can play his ass off, but there's a certain uh, there, there's a certain X factor that drummers have when they come from like a punk background or a rock background. That if you haven't grown up playing that style of music, you're not going to have. And he said that on their next album, they're going to sort of get back to that and bring that in and flash things up a little bit, like they used to. Which like I said I'm looking forward to because you know, Hail to the King was not my cup of tea, honestly. Okay. Well, that's a, that's agree fantastic. to disagree, Jack. It's okay. Not <laughs> no, everybody. It's not. Likes... Everyone needs to agree with me on my show. I'm just kidding. Not everybody likes creed and kiss. And... Oh, Jesus, really? You're you're bringing that up again? And Hulk Hogan. <laughs> you also don't think Bjorn Speed Strid should scream in uh, soil work? So oh, no, soil I, work no, I awesome. don't. Yes, soil work is great, and Bjorn should scream a lot. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Chris Jericho should still be called Moon Goose McQueen. Jesus, what is this pick on Jack Knight? Holy shit! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. God damn. Oh, just, a, just a little bit of a roast every now and then. Never heard anybody. No, no, it's not. It's my show. It doesn't have to be a roast. <laughs> Taking over. NWO. Yeah. Pretty, pretty much. Wrestling um, references. No, what? The, what? The, I, I, I'm completely off track now. I, I uh, but I mean, no. Um, they, they did bring up a really good point about uh about why, I, I guess, you know, they were looking to go in a different creative direction. Aaron, who I think is a great player, I've seen him play with Avenged Sevenfold Live. I thought he nailed the old songs perfectly. Oh, I love the Hail, I love the Hail of the King record. I mean, anything that you guys may have liked or disliked about it, I don't think has really had anything to do with Aaron Illiger. They had a direction they wanted to take with the record, so they did it. Um, I thought he did a great job, and and they were amicable amicable about it. It wasn't because he was a bad player or because they didn't like him. They just, I I think they kind of wanted Brooks Wackerman to be in there from the start, but he just wasn't available. So That's true. I, I I think I think that was more of a case of that, and where it's like they needed they needed someone at the time, and, and you know Aaron was the guy, but you know again they fit, you know and, and you guys have been in and out of bands for a while, like I have. Sometimes it's not necessarily because you're the best drummer or even if you get along with, with with the person. It's not necessarily a personal thing or or this person's not good enough. Sometimes it's yeah. just people just fit together differently and the chemistry is different. And sometimes that's why those those things occur. I mean, so it's not really a personal or music decision. It's just one of those things that just it just kind of feels right in the moment. And I think that's why they did what they did and why they felt they needed to make a change. Yeah, I think it's sure. like a timing, a timing issue. It's right, it was like, actually the same thing when that they said when Godsmack started. They had, uh, I can't remember the guy's name, I think it was Tommy something. He was their original drummer on the Tommy first two Stewart, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, Sully always said, you know, he had Tommy in the band, but if he ever had a chance to get Shannon Larkin, he'd drop him in a second. And as soon as Shannon Larkin became available, that's what happened. Right, so I mean, I guess it just kind of worked out that way. Um, I, I'll be the first to tell you, I'm not familiar with Brooks Wackerman's playing. I don't know how good he is. I hear he's good. Again, that's why I well, got I you mean, guys on here because you guys are drummers, so you guys yeah, you're all, 
you're also not a drummer, so you don't listen out to that right. type of thing. Um, so, I mean, so it's one of those things. Obviously, I'm assuming this guy's a badass because otherwise they wouldn't have had him be in the band. Right, they you know, get any drummer in the world. <laughs> right. And, he, yeah, man, he's, he's another one of those guys like Josh Reese. I keep mentioning them in the same breath because not only were they both in the Vandals, they're two of the most sought after. Like, you need a drummer, they're, they'll fill in, like, immediately. Those guys can learn shit so fast and play so fast. Like, I'm sure he's already got the whole catalog down on, like, the plane ride over, <laughs> like, to uh, to jam with those guys or whatever. He, he's he's such a quick learner. He's so good. Right. Well, I, it, it would be awesome. I, I, does, uh, does Brooks Wackerman sing at all? I think he does. Because that oh. would be cool if he could like replicate like you know Jimmy's old vocal parts, but I'm I, not I sure. Think, I'm not sure. I don't think they're going to do that, but that would yeah. be kind of cool. Yeah, you got to see I how almost... fast he is, man. He's, he's such almost... a fast. No, oh, sorry. I almost oh, sorry. Meant to say uh, the Rev is the best singer in Avenge Sevenfold. Honestly, yeah. dude is ridiculous on vocals yeah, and drums. Oh, now you guys are just talking crazy. Come on, oh, now. here we go. It's two on one, so. Um, I'm not taking his side purposely. I just have to agree with a lot of shit that he said. Like, right. I'm honest. <laughs> Am I going to kiss your ass just because it's your show? You know, come on. Well, s- since when have you ever? Live, live a little. <laughs> YOLO. <laughs> Sorry. What is this, head of the class? <laughs> I think, I think it's... Head of the class. <laughs> it's Herman's head. <laughs> right. It's Parker Lewis can't lose. Oh, or we're just going to drop some more obscure references in there? We could do that yeah. all night. This is I've, all going over my head. I forgot whatever the hell we were talking about. So. No, completely. Um, Brooks, Wackerman. That's right. Yeah, yeah, he's he's a dude. He's in the band now. We're so. talking about the fact that you're not familiar with any of the shit that he's played. Like, if you've heard Tenacious D, I think their last album, I'm pretty sure he played on that. Well, I mean, well, I, mean, well, I heard in the interview, he said that Dave Grohl play, has played on the Tenacious D records. Oh, Brooks that's has right. just done live stuff with them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you're not about to listen to the Vandals or Bad Religion, but I guess I could send you links to some of that stuff. I, I would listen to the bad, the Vandals or Bad Religion if people you know, to, pointed me in the right direction. I'm not yeah, opposed gotta, to doing that. You I just find the right song. It's, if you just try to dive in head first, you'll be like, well, I don't know what the fuck. Like, right. I, I mean, I, I, I think you guys are misunderstanding me. I'm like, I'm not like anti Bad Religion or the Vandals. I just haven't oh, I get it. gotten around get to it. hearing them yet. I'm not closed minded to them. I, I just haven't done it yet. So I, I, I was just asking you, you know, when. Uh, I, I know, dude. Just relax. No one's accusing you of anything. <laughs> I'll say he. I just I'm on his Wikipedia page looking at some of the other stuff he played on. He played on that really weird Corn Untitled album. That's uh, right. Really? Yeah, I heard about that. It had an evolution on it. And yeah, Terry it like... Bozio said he wanted uh, to be a full band member and get 25% of the revenue. So then they brought oh, in Brooks. <laughs> That's the right. album. That, I remember that album. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, what else? Is, I feel like he's played on other things I just can't remember. Like, he did. Whole... Um, Let's see. Yeah, he was on the new Tenacious D record. He played on a couple of Avril's records. Avril Levine. Avril. Mm-hmm. Avril. Suicidal Tendencies, Infectious Grooves, and then if you go way back, That's his right. first Infectious band. Infectious Grooves, man. He was young. He was like 16 yeah. or 17. And, and then man. Bad for Good, he was even younger. Anybody remember Bad for Good? Vaguely. Um, I, I, I hadn't heard of them, but he talked about it on the interview this morning, and, and I'm, I'm, I just pulled up his, Wiki, his Wikipedia page right now. So that was back in 1992. Apparently that was like they were all teenagers at the time in that band. The lead singer was Danny Cooksey. He was a he was um you know oh, he was an actor. actor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the actor. I he thought was I recognized that name. That's yeah, so he, was, weird. he was on um what show? Salute was your he? shorts. Yeah, he, yeah, it's he was Bud Nick from Salute Your Shorts. Bud he was. Uh, they want to fart. Yeah, that's yeah, it. He, <laughs> yeah, he was John Connor's buddy in Terminator Two. Different and, strokes. Uh, he's also uh, Arnold's yeah. friend on Different Strokes. Yeah, he was Arnold's buddy on Different Strokes. So he was man, a we were giving actor. we're putting Danny Cook to you over hard tonight. <laughs> <What? He's> legit. <laughs> This is Seriously. the best thing that ever happened to him. Is his buddy is he getting playing, the is he playing drums for Avenger Seven? Well, no, are, we, are, we just, are we just marking out for Danny Cooksey? Is he going to take Matt Shadows' place now? God damn! <laughs> Can you imagine? I think he did. If he's you gonna, listen to that Bad for Good stuff, he sounds awesome. Does he really? Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll have to look up the Bad for Good. And that dude stuff. can sing his ass off. It's good. Oh. But I mean, not to glance yeah. over, dude. Infectious grooves and suicidal tendencies is major. Like I forgot about those too. Like. Those two, those, that was some like funk type shit. So the guy plays all kinds of different genres, music, metal. He's he's perfect. He's a perfect, like he's exactly what you would want to have in your band as a replacement drummer. 
Gotcha. Well, and and I think that is the key to what they were looking for is versatility and guys who I mean, you know, Brooks Wackerman. He's a little bit older than than the guys from Avenged Sevenfold, but only by a few years. He's yeah, he's from, still he's super young, man. He right. Like he's kind of from that uh, that same area. He's from Long Beach. They're from Huntington Beach, so he has that Southern California punk vibe that they. I mean. People kind of forget Avenged Sevenfold was a very punk influenced band, especially at the beginning. So it's like, so they have that sort of you know influence in there. So you know he connects with them on that level as well. So I I'm think sure, that's, uh, I'm sure Bad Religion and Avenged Sevenfold did a few warp tours together or something like that. They, they have actually that that was uh, that was what they had mentioned in the in the interview that I'd hope you would listen to before doing this <laughs> podcast. Well, now you got me all hyped up for it. I can't wait well, to listen to it. Well, for after. Christ's sake, Brian, go and listen to this when we're done. In I fact, a, a, every one of you guys listening to this should go listen to the uh, the the Talk Is Jericho. Um, interview that they do with M Shadows and Brooks Wackerman about this because they'll give a lot more information, a lot more useful information than we will. I guarantee you. They get paid to say that? Sounds like a ringing endorsement. I I wish. <laughs> right. Make sure you use promo code Phoenix when you're logging in and talk to Jericho. <laughs> UDP nice. Yoga. Right. Yeah. I, I wish I had a piece of that money. Come on. But uh, but no. I mean, like you go there and um. But I think the point was, like, that's why they maybe didn't connect with Aaron Illiger as well, because, you know, him being a little bit younger, he's probably into different stuff and probably didn't really know a lot of the stuff where the rest of the guys in Avenge came from. So when it came to to write and to go in this new direction that they may go to, whatever that may be in the next album, that's where that's why they wanted this new guy in there. Yeah, dude, it's, I think Aaron was just young and inexperienced. That's right. I can think about it. He went from, I mean, I, I think he'd done like a little bit of touring in some smaller bands, but you basically go from being almost a nobody into the biggest, one of the biggest metal bands in the world. Right. I mean, that's not an easy task for anybody, but. No, I mean, and, and I thought he did a great job, you know? Yeah, considering. I, I definitely yeah, think uh, he did. I just wish they would have let him cut loose on Hail to the King a little more. Yeah, was, was, Hail, was Hail to the King like a, was that a, a number one album too? I don't it know. It was. It debuted at number one. Right on. So yeah, that's two number one albums in a row. So I, I like you're saying like they're not really a household name, but a lot of people know who they are eventually. Uh, a, a lot of people do. I mean, but uh, still, I mean, like I said, they have that they have that fan base. They're, they're so they're like they'll have number one albums. They'll sell out arenas and everything. But it's like, I mean, and I guess and again, it's all relative because I like even this morning I was like talking to a buddy of mine at work. I was like, hey man, are you? Are you familiar with? Uh, you listen to Avenged Sevenfold? He's like, I'm. I've never heard of those guys. So I mean, I imagine most people know Backcountry, and that's about it. <laughs> I, 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 I probably less even know that. I mean, I, it's one of those things. Call I ask, like my buddies at work, and like none of those guys even know who Avenged Sevenfold are. So it's are they young. Are they younger dudes, or are they like same? Uh, no, nah, they're like around my age or whatever. Like guys at my again, it's a yeah, but not every, everybody's a rocker, man. You know, like well, yeah, I I know, <laughs> but that but that's my point. They're probably uh, listening to Ariana Grande and Drake. Uh, right. Yeah, definitely. Well, that that's my point. It's like even if you're not fans, if you know who someone is, that's what I define as like being a household name. Like you know, or like Toby Keith and going that right. other direction of that kind of right. And you know, look look, if that's what you're into, that's what you're into. Nothing wrong with that. I I I, I was There's just a lot giving, wrong with that. But. I was just given to some perspective. <laughs> yeah. But anyways, I mean, it sounds like, I mean, obviously they feel like they're making the right choice. Obviously this dude's a badass on drums if he's playing for Revenge Sevenfold. So, yeah. um, I, I think, I think you won't be disappointed and that's no. like a lot of hype, you know, about whatever, but no, uh, I, 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 no. And I mean, I know there are going to be a lot of people shitty about it and be like, Oh, well, Everything sucks after the Rev died. They should have just called it quits. I'm, I Everything disagree. sucks after their first album. Yeah, you get a lot of that. Oh yeah. my god, dude! Really? Did you listen to any of it? No, I just know that it sucks because that album's all I like ever. That's it's like okay. Well, well then don't... he started singing. Right. It's like <laughs> yeah. well then don't then don't tell me you're an Avenged Sevenfold fan because you're not because you're not an yeah. Avenged Sevenfold fan anymore. You're a so one album of theirs fan. Yeah, it's like you you used to be an Avenged Sevenfold fan. You're just not anymore, and, and that's, that's okay. The, that's that's the fine. crazy thing about like Facebook and any kind of social media is people still like them and are following them and are fans of them. But then when news is released, they still feel the need to like talk shit. So, like, why do you? Why would you continue to like something that you don't like? 
I don't understand. Yeah, it's like it's like okay. I mean, you know, I get it. You have an opinion. That's cool. But it's like, don't tell me you're a fan then, because you're obviously not a fan anymore. And and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just well, you you always consider the source of anybody that's given you any kind of review or criticism. Like, all right, well, if this band sucks, what do you like? And then oh, you'll be exactly. amazed at what they say. <laughs> Well, I mean, and look, everyone has the right to their opinion and all that, all that crap. Yeah, but, um, all that bullshit that <laughs> I don't believe in. But you know, it's it, you know, it's one of those things. I like Avenged Sevenfold. I think they are a great band. I think they deserve to continue and have a long, um, successful career. And I'm glad that they're getting the chance to do that and that they found the guy who they feel is is right for it. And I don't and care I'm, who you are. You'd be crazy not to take the money or the offer that they gave him to play with. You know. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, yeah. The, obviously, there's that to it, but obviously, Brooks must feel good about it. So it's he's got know, a solid gig. He's got a good. It's like a good decision to leave Bad Religion, who was doing okay. They weren't, you know, starving, I imagine, but they've been around for 30 years, and they were. Bad Religion was signed to a major label for a little while. Like they tried. Right. They had 21st Century Digital Boy, Infected, like a few songs. They try to get 98 Rock. I guess you could play him. Yeah, it's and, never, and, it never really took off. Right, and I know uh, Jimmy Sullivan, the Rev. I mean, he was a fan of of Brooks Wackerman and Bad Religion. Oh, totally, like, they, man. like yeah, they yeah. they knew each other from the Warp Tour days and everything. They weren't like super close friends or anything, but like they were aware of each other. So it's like the, he goes back with those guys. So also, I, I, yeah, you mentioned Brooks Wackerman comes from, and much like Josh Freeze, they come from musical families. Right. Brooks has a famous bass playing brother named Chad Wackerman, I believe, who like a uh, jazz fusion type guy. Well, yeah, his brother Chad is actually a drummer and played for Frank Zappa for many years. Well, he's, uh, there's also a bass player in the family. Yeah. <laughs> Wackerman. It's crazy. And, and, and Sinister Gates is a huge Zappa fan, so, I mean, that's, that's you know, another little connection there. Oh, uh, at least th- this crazy. is all this according to the uh, to the interview with Jericho. Uh, so. Did they address the fact that he might have a weird stage name? Uh, they they, jo- they joked about it a little bit. He's like, what are they going to call you, W. Ackerman? <laughs> you know. By the way, with a last name like Wackerman, of course you're going to be a drummer because you're whacking it. You know, oh, it's, uh, that's uh, perfect. Uh, yeah. yeah, see what I did there. Nice. You're, yeah. I'm sure you're the first person to point that out. Okay. I, I'm I'm not. That would be Chris Jericho. <laughs> you know, he's oh. paying me. He's paying me to say this. By the way. Yeah, this is brought this brought to you by Talk Is Jericho. Right. I wish. Get a cowbell. Yeah. Well, I, 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 Brian, I could tell you about you know the band he and I and, and Mark Germani are starting, but that's that, that's just a whole different. <laughs> All right, we that's don't just have a whole different thing. That, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's gonna put, be William Hung and Aerosmith all day put, long. Put yourself over. <laughs> of course, it's my show. I'm gonna do right. that. It's all about me. Say it. Yeah. Well, anyways, I was glad to get you guys' uh, you know opinions and thoughts on that. It sounds like you guys are in favor of it. Is that would, would that be safe to say? Thumbs up for me. Cool. Two thumbs up. All right. Well, it, it's interesting to see. Uh, it's exciting news for Avenged Sevenfold fans. I'm curious to see what this next record is going to sound like. Um, yeah, I, I can't wait. And uh, I'm just glad to hear that Avenged Sevenfold is moving forward and going to continue to make new music and tour. Um, you know, no matter who's behind the drum kit, I'm an Avenged Sevenfold fan. So I'm in it for the long haul. And I know you guys are too. For sure. Fuck yeah. Now I am. All right. Cool. All right. Well, thank you guys for joining. Any, anything, any last minute things you guys want to plug? Eric, what do you, what have you got going on with Salvation Syndicate and all your various projects right now? Uh, Salvation Syndicate record is still being recorded, believe it or not, two years after I recorded the drums for it. Um, so it's moving slowly, but it's moving forward. Um, next thing I got going on on December 12th, if anybody is in the Cleveland, Ohio area, my buddy Michael McFarland is putting out an EP Um that's the release day at Lakewood in at the uh, symposium. I actually did uh, production mixing mastering on the record. So uh, I'll be up there for that. Um, I don't think I'm going to play anything with him, but he's a very talented guy and a good friend. So if he, that, that's what I will use my time to plug. Very cool. Very cool. And uh, where, where can they follow you on social media, Eric? Uh, Facebook. I'm slash Eric B drums. Uh, Twitter, the underscore Eric underscore B, uh, and then Instagram, I'm also Eric B drums. That's probably the only ones I ever really get on anymore. Very cool. All right. Awesome, man. Thank you for, uh, thank you for joining up with us. Tell Kurt hi for me. Will do, man. 
And uh, yeah, same thing with Britt and Paul and Corey and all those guys. Uh, Brian, uh, you are back on social media. I know this much. Yes, but I don't have anything to plug or promote other than Chris Jericho's Talk is Jericho podcast, which is available. <laughs> oh, wait, you, you've heard of that? <laughs> uh, which I yeah, highly yeah, recommend. He, he has his own podcast, by the way. I don't know I if also, you've heard about this. I also want to mention that the WWE Network is only nine ninety nine. Get out of here. Sign up for your free trial now. What? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and uh they have I will their say, own channel now i i hadn't heard they have their own app what is that about like i don't know dude it's it's the word on the street i'm not too sure if it's even true but check it out if you want and then i will also mention as an exclusive to your podcast please there, please there will, there will be new episodes soon of uh the schmelz cast really? and we, we will have a show either late december or early january for our 20th anniversary it's going to be huge. More details. That to come. is huge news. <laughs> Little exclusive. Dude, this is this is a bombshell dropping. I mean, oh yeah, just... I'm dropping pipe bombs here. Left. Yeah, and right. you are. You and Rex Cocksmith and the whole gang. I love it. That's right. All right. Brooks Wackerman and everybody. Brooks, <laughs> Brooks, Brooks is going to be man. there. Wow. Sure. Why not? Amazing. Wow. That guy's playing with everybody these days. And uh, and Danny Cooksey and Lord <laughs> Alfred Hayes, <laughs> 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 William Hung. They'll all be there. Wow. Alfred, Super, Hayes, is com- the Alfred Hayes is coming from beyond the grave to be at the Schmelz 20th anniversary. It's, it's that's kind of a big deal. It's important. That's you incredible. Know. Wow. That's, I mean, everyone's going to be there. So uh, we've got to keep plugging that as much as possible. Oh, yeah. That, you know, and like I said, there'll be more details. The world will know. We will let everybody know about it. That's for sure. Oh boy. Well, this, this has been great. This has been, uh, well, I mean, this has been chaotic, basically. <laughs> Sorry about that. Ah, that's nah, it's my a, fault. It's all it's my been, fault. No, nah, it's okay. It's uh, I mean, I, I probably come off as like a major asshole in this thing. Be like, this is my show. <laughs> I, I feel, I feel bad about that now. What kind of snappy? How, how's your you guys. ego feel, there, Triple H? I don't know. It's uh, I mean, I because I don't, I, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be that like maniacal thing. But you know, it's that's my job, dude. I'm the heel. You're the exactly, baby. exactly. Trying to make me heel turn or something. I don't know. I mean, we're all allowed at one heel turn swerve occasionally. Right. I, I got I got to baby face it up on here. I'm not, <laughs> now nobody are... nobody knows what the hell we're talking about right now. No, it's it's you know. all gibberish. If you're not wrestling fans, it's you're probably like, who the hell is Lord Alfred Hayes, and why are we keep <laughs> talking about him? <laughs> no matter what podcast I'm on, I'm sorry, dude. Well, that... emotional consideration paid for by Talk is Jericho and I. <laughs> Don't forget about Danny Cooksey. And and what was this band called? Bad for Good. Bad for Bad Good. Bad for Good. Featuring Budnick. Salute your shorts. Fuck yeah. Nice. Well, uh, on that note, I think we're going to wrap this up here. <laughs> thank you, gentlemen, for coming on. All right. I definitely want to thank Eric and Brian. Um, I do want to apologize. This is coming out, I think, you know, over almost two weeks since the original announcement. I apologize for the delay in that, but, uh, you know, I've been a little busy. But uh, it's out now, and I hope you guys have enjoyed the podcast. Uh Definitely, uh, definitely a lot of laughs, uh, a couple little arguments in there, uh, a couple of uh, times they, they ripped me a little bit, but hopefully you guys found that entertaining. It was entertaining for me to do it. Um, before I end this podcast, I do want to share a few uh, final thoughts that I've had since, uh, since I originally recorded that interview. Um, first things first, I have actually... I have actually since gone and listened to some of Brooks Wackerman's work on Bad Religion's album, The Process of Belief, which was the first Bad Religion record he played on back in 2002, and uh, I thought it sounded great. I, I thought, you know, I was very impressed by it. I thought he's a really solid drummer, and I can't wait to hear what he does with Avenged Sevenfold when they put out their record next year. Also, uh, another thing, I, go, I know the guys were kind of making fun of me uh, for talking about Chris Jericho's podcast. Uh, as much as I did. I did that for a reason because that was the actual interview with M. Shadows and Brooks Wackerman that explained, I mean, that not only announced uh, Brooks getting the gig, but, you know, why it happened, sort of gave the whole backstory of it. And, uh, you know, the reason why it's so important to listen to these things is because you get the actual facts of what happened from the guys themselves. You see, when I do these podcasts... I try to be as objective as possible because I want to get in, I want to get as many of my facts straight before, you know, shooting off an opinion and, you know, because I want to hear it from the actual guys themselves. Now, granted, 
you know, I'm sort of taking their word for it because I'm not there. I, you know, I don't know everything about what happens behind the scenes, but I don't want to assume what happened before. That's sort of a pet peeve of mine, and I'm not making fun of Eric or Brian for this, but I think there is a tendency to assume that this is why this happened or or this is why, um, you know, Mike Portnoy is not with them or this is why they didn't like Aaron or, uh, or this is why they did... You know, they decided to make a change, or this is why Brooks left Bad Religion. This is all speculation, okay? You know, it's not hard to do a Google search or check Wikipedia or, you know, do a little research in this day and age, you know, and and try to get some of your facts straight before you just start assuming stuff, okay? That's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine. And again, I'm not trying to single out Brian or Eric about this, but this is... But when I give analysis of these situations, you know, guys just assume this is why this happened. Or, oh, they must need money, that's why they're doing that, or, or, or whatever the case may be. Like, we don't know. We're not in their shoes, okay? As fans, of course we're going to have our opinions. But, you know, when you start assuming that this is what the facts are, when it's not true, at least certainly not according to those guys, and I tend to take their word over someone else's because they're the ones who are actually there and living it so again that that's just something i wanted to get off my chest you know not trying to pick on brian or eric i'm I'm not trying to do that i'm not trying to single anyone out but when you come on my show and you try to you know give your give your opinion about something try to do a little research okay try to do something that's going to back up your opinion rather than just assuming stuff Okay, that that's that's all I wanted to say. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, the the funny thing is, uh, those guys clearly weren't big fans of the Hail to the King album, and I know they were kind of making fun of me for kind of groaning when they said that they weren't. Those guys, you know, look, they have their rights to to their opinion. Everyone has the right to their opinion, but I, you know, I, it seems like when it comes to albums like Hail to the King. There seems to be a couple common criticisms that I keep hearing, and you know, before I want to close out, I I, I sort of want to address that and give my thoughts on it. Um, sort of the the complaint, uh, one of the complaints about that record was that the drums, you know, they don't necessarily, they didn't, he didn't cut loose. They weren't quite complicated enough, and they weren't sort of as flashy as previous Avenged Sevenfold records. Um, again, I want to restate that that to me, doesn't seem to be a reflection on Aaron Illigay's skill as a drummer, uh, especially because I've heard him play the old Avenge Sevenfold material, and he crushed it every time I heard him. Uh, it sounded great. Now, I'm not a drummer myself, but I felt that the drum parts on the Hail of the King record were very impressive. And more importantly, I, th- I felt that they were what was right for those songs. Now, just because, and, and this goes for any instrument in a band, just because an instrument isn't necessarily in your face or incredibly flashy all the time does not mean that that instrument is not doing its job. Now, in my opinion, when the song itself is the priority, that to me takes precedence over how intricate and flashy your musicianship is. And I think that in itself was the point of the Hail of the King record. They wanted to go, they had a particular direction that they wanted to go. It's more classic, more um, sort of groove oriented, less about how many different, you know, melodies can we over top, you know, can we overlay and how many d- crazy time signatures can we put in there. That really wasn't the point of that record, which is, you know, kind of why I liked it, to be honest. Uh, you know, it was a straight ahead rock record. I think it did its job. And I thought it still sounded great. It was still Avenged Sevenfold to me. So, um, you know, I mean, but that's always been me because I've I've always enjoyed bands who tend to take risks on their records. Uh, the thing about Avenged Sevenfold that I like is that they don't necessarily record the same album over and over again. Now, some bands who have been together for a long time tend to do that. They tend to have their signature sound. It's what's comfortable for them and they tend to stay in that same um, that same area musically. And there's nothing wrong with that because for a lot of bands, that tends to work for them. For their fans, it doesn't, 
it's not necessarily too challenging. They can kind of get behind that, and they've had very successful careers from that. But I find that most bands who have been together for a long time and have had a great deal of success, you always notice there tend to be one or two albums that don't necessarily stick to that classic sound or that classic formula. They tend to take risks. Um, There have been a lot of bands, and there are way too many to list, who have done that over the years. And I really respect that because I think as an artist, you need to keep growing. You need to keep reinventing yourself. And and that's that's the only way you do it. And I think sometimes you need to take risks like that in order to, you know, in order to expand your sound. Sometimes, you know, sometimes it's a hit with the fans. Sometimes it's not. But I, you know, I definitely respect Avenged Sevenfold for not doing the same thing every time. And you know, doing what they feel is right for the band because really at the end of the day, they are Avenged Sevenfold and they should determine what an Avenged Sevenfold album should sound like. You know, I mean, that's, you know, I mean, the fans can say all they want and the critics can say whatever they want, but eventually they, you know, they decide what their, their sound should be. And I think they should be allowed the freedom to do so. And I mean, if you don't like it, don't buy the album or don't go see them in concert, whatever the case may be. But, you know, that's that's just how I feel about it. And, you know, I, I feel about... That's how I feel about bands in general who, t- who take risks with their material. So I definitely love the Hail to the King album. Give it a shot. You might look at it differently or you might like it. Um, you never know. So another criticism I found, um, I keep hearing about that record, though, is that um, they ripped off Metallica's Black Album, or they ripped off Megadeth or Iron Maiden or Pantera. It sounded too much like their influences. It wasn't original enough. Now, I, I, I will I will concede that um, one of the songs, uh, This Means War, does sound a lot like Sad But True, at least in that that main uh, riff that, that sort of, you know, across the, um, the verse of it. It sounds a lot like Metallica's Sad But True. Um, not exactly like it, mind you, but there are definitely some similarities. You can't deny that. I don't think the guys in the band would deny that. Um, and, uh, let's see, what else do they have? Uh, Doing Time, for example, that was another track off the album. Uh, that sounded a bit like Guns N' Roses. Um, I can't think of a particular song that it sounded like, but it definitely had that GNR sound. It sounded like it could have been a Guns N' Roses song. Um, you know, and, and like I mentioned, there there were comparisons to Megadeth, Iron Maiden, Pantera, and a few other bands. Um, but do I feel that they ripped off anyone? No. Because, uh, and I'm going to let you guys in on a little secret. Um, <laughs> every band is influenced by someone else. I don't care who you are. There is no band or artist of any kind who has not tried to emulate whoever their influences are. Uh, you know, it, it, just, it just boggles my mind how people, they, they want to be the originality police. They want to <laughs> be like, this guy ripped off this person, or, or this song sounds like this. It, if you meet someone who claims to be a complete original, who has never tried to sound like anyone else who is not influenced by anyone who has never, you know, copped or quote unquote stolen from someone else, please introduce them to me because I, I want to talk to this person. You know, human nature is that we, you know, we are influenced by other people. When we are children, we learn how to talk by listening to our parents you know, it's the same way with music. So th- this whole, th- this whole um, originality police mentality that's going around is just, I- I'm just, I'm sick of hearing about it because no artist is 100% original. That just does not exist. Now, do some people quote unquote rip off other artists? You know, maybe, I don't know. I wasn't in the studio with them. But I can tell you, as a guy who's been in a band for years, and as a guy who has written many songs over the years, you know, I don't go into uh, making music with the thought, well, I'm just going to take this song and change it a little bit and call it my own. Now, 
Am I influenced by other artists? Of course I am. You know, absolutely. That's I, I don't deny that. I don't, you know, shy away from my influences whatsoever. They're very much a part of who I am. Um, <laughs> have I ripped anyone off? I don't think so. I mean, you know, I'm sure people might hear some of my music and think that I have, you know. But, I mean, if you look deep enough at any song, you can find similarities to something else. You know, there, there are a few YouTube videos going around. Um, I, I forget what it's called, but there was this there's one um, that had to do with, like... Um, the same four chords are used in every major pop song of the last, you know, 40 years, whatever it may be. And uh, and it's funny, you look at that, because that's just the way music is. You know, nobody is 100% original. You know, I'm sorry, I'm, and that might sound like a cop-out answer to you, but that to me is, that's how I see it. Because, you know, I think people just get go way overboard about that sort of thing and I kind of think it's sort of a stock answer when you don't like something but you don't really have a good enough reason to explain why you didn't like something you so you'll say oh this guy's a ripoff or this guy's you know just copying this other person you know if I were you I would go rethink that situation and really listen to what the thing you're criticizing because you might find out that it might not be as big of a ripoff as you think it is So I'm just going to leave you with that. So thank you guys for listening. Um, You can follow me on Twitter at JackXConnor. Also, you can like me on Facebook at Facebook.com slash JackConnorMusic. Feel free to check out my band, Vertebraker, at www.vertebraker.net. And if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, make sure you email me at JackConnorPodcast at gmail.com or tweet me with the hashtag PhoenixReport. And if you're listening to this on YouTube or iTunes, make sure you subscribe, leave a comment, and go back and listen to all the other episodes. Thank you guys for listening once again. This has been the Phoenix Report with Jack Connor on the TwoBadBrains.com.